So we are going to do character theory today. So our assumption will be G is finite group and our field will be underlying base field we take it to be C. I will mention every time I will mention what the assumptions are okay but for today we are going to take G to be finite and the base field to be C. The properties of C that will be crucial for us are at, at one I know we are going to use Mashke's theorem therefore something about the characteristic of the field with respect to the group is necessary okay. since I do not want to get into technicalities with this let us assume characteristic 0. So, no matter what the finite group is, what finite group you give, you have Nash case theorem that is applicable. Okay. Here the relevant thing is that, that the field this the relevant property of C is that it is of characteristic 0. The algebraic closure is irrelevant for Nash case theorem. Okay. The second thing we will use is Schur's lemma that will also come into the uh, you will see that it is it's, it will enter crucially into the arguments. Okay. There we are going to use the version where the field is algebraically closed. Okay. So, you will need the algebraic closure you will need something on the characteristic. So, to avoid complications to keep it simple we just assume C. Okay. Now, already with C the Theorem, theorems are beautiful and so, so there is no really at, you know on a first pass to assume that the field is C is, uh, is, is a good thing there is nothing um, I, I need not be apologetic about it ok. okay. So, what, what do we want to do we want to find a way of listing all the irreducible representations of G over now, when I say representations, now it is always over C, all the complex irreducible representations. Okay. So, uh, let us see. So, want to classify all irreps or classify irreps. right that is one problem. Second, so we want to have a list of irreducible representations. For example, Avijit was asking it is not clear that there are only finitely many irreducible representations right. Given a, given a group given a, given a finite group always assume C now there are only finitely many irreducible representations. Well, you know that maybe you because you know some theorem, but a priori is that clear? Yes, but why? Okay, yeah. okay. No, not for you know. Yeah. So it is true that there are only finitely many, and it's that's not very difficult. Okay, it's not very difficult to see because every irreducible representation must be a quotient of the group ring okay so let's maybe prove that okay see uh, well okay so here is an observation side observation i'm already getting sidetracked <laughs> observation okay every this has nothing to do with so any field any group any irreducible representation is a quotient of 
the group ring. Proof. Let V be rep. So choose zero not equal to V in V. Right? Now extend the map. See Fg. What is Fg? I want to give a map from Fg to this. Fg to V. Right? So to give what is Fg? Fg is as a vector space, it's a free vector space with basis G. So it's enough that I specify G, right? From where every element of G goes. Extend the map G to GV. G, I send G to GV linearly to FG. Right? So you get a map. Okay. What's the image? The image I claim is, so first of all, this map is a G morphism. Why? Right? That's obvious to see because if I multiply this by H, uh, it goes to HGV which is the action of H on GV, right? So this is a G morphism, okay? Its image is a, its image is G invariant. Again, for the same reason. If I take the span of, the same reason that we wrote down there, okay? Observe, image of this map, image of this map, Continue here. Is a is a gene variant, right? Because you see, because if I take span of G V, G in G, that's what the image is, right? Now, if I, this is a G invariant set. This set is G invariant. So the span of a G invariant set is going to be a G invariant subspace. Okay? So this is because, <coughs> okay, because, uh, okay, let's write it like this, because this is a, is a G invariant subset. So, but V was irreducible and uh, V was chosen to be non-zero. So this, thus, V is equal to the image because V is an irreducible ring. Right? So, every Irreducible represent, representation is a quotient of the group ring Fg. Okay? Now, to say that, that there are only finitely many irreducible representations in any, for any, okay. Now, now if I take G to be a finite group, no matter what field I take, it, this is still true. This we have proved for any group, any field. Okay? So, any irreducible representation will be a quotient of Fg. Okay? Now, therefore, okay. That's also you get, you get that. You get, the, you, you could, uh, you know, the earlier exercise you could have proved by saying this. That's one thing. But how, how do you now conclude that there are only finitely many irreducible representations? It's still not, there could be, see, all we have done is, 
every irreducible representation is a quotient of G or FG of the group ring. Right? Now, if you now you need to use something called Jordan Holder theorem. Okay? Uh, 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 was this done at all? No. Okay. So we will do that at some point. Okay. So now an application of Jordan Holder will tell you that there are only finitely many irreducible representations. I don't want to get sucked into that at this moment because that's I'm, I'm already getting a little away from um, you know I want to do character theory today. Okay. But now so. So now, so this is QED for this statement, this observation. Now, combining the observation, so I'll write it here. Observation plus Jordan Holder implies for any finite group. any field over any field the number of irreps is fine yes yes you can write that yes, yes. yeah Yeah, V is a quotient of this. Right. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yes, V is equal to FG by. Yeah, that itself does not prove that there could be infinitely many quotients. Now you have to use the, if you use Jordan Holder, you, uh, the, uh, I'm sure you've seen some statement of Jordan Holder somewhere, but never mind, we'll do that. At some point, if you use that, then it will follow that there are only finitely many irreducible representations. Okay, so the the reason is why I wanted to tell this to you, Sumit, that maybe you are use see it will follow that there are finitely many irreducible representations from what we do today. In this case, okay, but that there are finitely many irreducible representations is a fact that lies much more. You know, it is it is that. It's a much more basic fact. You don't need anything about uh, algebraic closure or uh, uh, or uh, characteristic zero or any for any field. Okay, it's a much more general. Actually, the statement is much more general. Over a finite dimensional algebra, there are finitely many simple modules. This has nothing to do with the group itself. What what is relevant is the finite dimensionality of this. Uh, Algebra. So, if you have a finite dimensional algebra over a field, it has finitely many simple modules. The same proof. Any simple module is a quotient of the ring. And again, an application of Jordan Holder will give you that there, that there are only finitely many. Okay? Right? So, that answers your question modulo this Jordan Holder. Okay, now coming back to this, okay, we want to classify reps, meaning we want to list all the irreducible representations of a given finite group. Okay, that's one thing we want to do. The other thing we want to do is, I'm going to erase this, this is okay, is another important thing in applications of representation theory is. You want to given a representation, a natural representation, such as, for example, the group ring, the left regular representation. Okay, you want to. Now G is finite and the field is C. Aha. So you have mass case theorem. Okay. So I guess I need one more observation before I. Uh, given a representation so it will follow because we have mash case theorem that any rep any 
it had any representation, let's say finite dimensional. So just let me finish my statement and then you can ask. Okay? So given any given a finite dimensional representation, it breaks up as a direct sum of irreducible representations. Break it up. as a direct sum of irreducible representations. And so this breaking up is unique. As we will see, this breaking up is unique in the sense that if you say I take the, if you break it up one way and if I break it up another way, the cardinal, the, the, so if I write if the first irreducible representation 10 times, you would have also written it 10 times. If I take the second irreducible representation 20 times, you would have also written it 20 times. Ordering All right? Like hmm? Ordering, may be, Ordering may be different, but we will, we will see in what sense, you know, in a very strong sense, this breaking up is unique. We will prove that, okay? Again, this is, the, in the special case, this, we will prove this, you know, all this will follow from what we do, right? But these are general stuff. That is, the breaking up is unique can be proved in, in uh, uh, if something breaks up into irreducibles, as a direct sum of irreducibles, then the breaking up is unique. That's a very formal, general statement which is true in general context. But in our special context, we, without worrying about the, that general proof of uniqueness, we will get a hands-on proof of uniqueness. It will just pop up. Is this clear? Okay. So one more observation uh, before we start doing this. Okay? Okay. So. Amit had a question, uh, sorry, uh, Sumit and then Amit. Quotient of the of the left regular representation. Left regular. Yes. This will not be true, I don't think. I, if you ask me for an example, I would be stuck maybe, but. Uh, but in general, it is not true. Uh, no, no, definitely not true. Is definitely true. Not true. No, definitely not true. Definitely not true. There is a, okay. no, no, I know, I know many examples. It's not true. Yeah. No, it's not. So there are groups, for example, with infinitely many representations. Okay, so for, so for example, okay. <laughs> okay, there are uh, actually there are groups that you know very well that have infinitely many representations, and it's a very beautiful thing. I'll I'll mention it even if it is a side so issue. This is, so this is saying that there are infinitely many sub modules which are same but you have Well, even if there are not, uh, okay. At the moment, there are infinitely many quotients. Yes. Okay. Okay. There are examples when there are also any every quotient is a sub. Therefore. Okay. So. Yeah. So, but I'll give you the example. Yes. You had a question. Second observation. Yes, it follows from Mashke's theorem. But what is the Yes, correct. It's also true. That is going to be just to hold, you know, hold your thoughts for a minute because that's going to be my observation. Okay? In fact, I'm going to do a proposition. Okay? So, why is this true? So, the question is, why can I break it up into a direct sum of irreducibles? Why is every representation? This is a, as you correctly point out, this is a consequence of Mashke's theorem. But we will formally establish that 
first. That is going to be my observation. Okay, but uh, let us give uh, one example of this is a very important example and Fourier series. Okay, so let G be Z, G be the circle group. That is, under multiplication, right? The unit complex numbers. This is a group, OK? So this is, you can write this as e to the i theta, right? I mean, theta r or uh, more, you know, between 0 and 2 pi, whatever, OK? But I'll write. Now, here are, so um, consider, given n in z, consider, so what is a, what is a representation of uh, g? It is a homomorphism into some GLNC, okay? Now I'm going to claim that there are infinitely many irreducible representations of this group. I'm going to just list for you infinitely many irreducible representations, some list, which is infinite and th they will not be isomorphic, okay? There are different irreducible representations, infinitely many. I'm going to list, okay? Now, if they have to be irreducible, what can their dimension be? No, what is the dimension of an irreducible representation? Remember the theorem last class we proved, corollary of Schurz lemma, one dimensional. Because if G is an abelian group, then F is an algebraically closed field, then every irreducible representation is one dimensional. Right? Therefore, here we are thinking of complex representations, it's an algebraically closed field, therefore dimension must be one, okay? So I want, I want sort of GL maps to GL1C group homomorphisms, but GL1C is nothing but C star, right? It must be group homomorphisms. What are the group homomorphisms? Well. I mean, but G itself is a sub of C star, right? So, given N in C, consider, yes, so E to the I theta going to E to the N I theta or I N theta, however we want to write it. Claim that these are these irreducible representations are different. Well, it's obvious that they are inequivalent because if, you know, you, you, uh, no two elements are, you know, see, we, uh, to say that they are inequivalent, what do you have to show? That there is no matrix which conjugates this to that. But here the matrix, we are in C, you know, they are one dimensional. So it's an abelian thing. So if it is not literally the same, they cannot be equivalent. And uh, since there is always a theta such that e to the, uh, e to the i n theta is different from e to the, for some other m, if n is not equal to m, I can find a theta such that e to the i theta is, uh, i n theta is not the same as e to the i n theta. 
right? So these are all representations which are inequivalent, and there are infinitely many. There are at least as many as as many as z. Okay, clear? So obviously uh, the requirement for the previous statement that uh, that there are only finitely many irreducible representations requires that G is finite. I mean the hypothesis that G is finite can, cannot be dropped. This is Irreducible, yes. Ah. Ah. It is not irreducible, no? It will have a, it will have a invariant subspace. E1 is invariant. Yeah. Okay. These are all inequivalent one dimensional representations. Okay. Right? Okay. Now let's. Um, do the next observation, which is what uh, Amit was asking, or uh, pointing out rather that this, how can I break up, how am I sure that given a finite dimensional representation, it breaks up into a direct sum of irreducible representations, okay? Yes, let's do that formally, since it's an important statement. I want to state this formally. So here is a general statement. So can I erase this, this part? So uh, let's call this a proposition. Right? So I let F be a field. So A and F algebra. The following are equivalent for a finite dimensional A model. Finite dimensional over F, this is. Let's call the module M. See, in the application, this will be our, I am given a finite dimensional representation. I want to say it breaks up as a direction of irreducible representations, right? So finite, so instead of A, I will write FG. Right, instead of A, I will write FG. So that, I, then I will apply it to the, then you will see that the three, from the three statements it will follow that any, this M will be a direct sum of irreducible representation. So what are the equivalent statements? First is, okay, let's call it, give them numbers. One, M is a sum of simple submodules. Since I'm talking of modules here, I'll call them simple rather than 
say irreducible. Okay? But it's the same thing. So M is a direct sum. M, M is equal to three every submodule of M admits a Right? Uh, so make sure that you understand these statements. These are not, not, you know, I repeat, I might, you might, just because I, I don't want to give you the feeling that I'm writing, I'm being cavalier. I'm, I'm being very careful with what I'm writing. Okay, so uh, make sure that you understand clearly what what each statement means. M is a sum sum of simple sum modules. So you take take the sum of all its simple sub modules that gives you M, or M is the some sum of simple sub modules. Okay. The next one says M is a direct sum of certain sum, not all of its simple submodules, but some of its, there are simple submodules N1, N2, NR, such that M is a direct sum of them. Okay? And the third is every submodule of M admits a complement. Okay? These three are equivalent, this claim. Pardon me? A is an F algebra. It has nothing to do with a group. Okay? We are assuming A is an F algebra. So we are going to apply it to group theory, but it, this is a statement in ring theory, I mean module theory. Here means simple FG module. Simple FG module is the same as irreducible representation, right? Module for FG is the same thing as a representation for G. That is the go going back and forth between module, the language of modules, and the language of representations. Okay, so this is applicable to representations. Then, if I take a finite dimensional representation, look at this, of a group G, which is finite, for a moment, you just take a group G, a group G and a finite dimensional representation of that group over some field, okay? It says if I have three, then I have this. If I have, if this is true, then this is true. But we know so this is, Mashke's theorem tells us that exactly 3 is true under certain conditions. When G is finite and the characteristic, there is an assumption on the characteristic and G is finite, this is true, right? 
So if I assume we are assuming G is finite and the base field is C, so Marshke's theorem will imply 3, and therefore 3 implies T at A E means all the following are equivalent. So this holds by Marshke, therefore this holds by this proposition, the equivalence of these statements, and therefore I am justified in saying that a finite dimensional representation is the is a, it can be written as a direct sum of irreducible representations. All right? Okay. Now let's prove this. Before uh, we prove, let's make a comment. Uh, so I'll erase this, but really this is our idea. Right? These are the two things we want to accomplish. We want to write down or write down in f at least philosophically, in principle, all the irreducible representations or at least know where to look for them, okay? So, and second, given an irreducible representation, often representations are given, sorry, given a finite dimensional representation, often representations occur naturally. But sometimes they are irreducible, sometimes they are not irreducible. When they are not irreducible, we want to, or even, given a representation, you want to write it as a sum of irreducible representations. So in particular, you want to know, is it irreducible or not? Okay, so these are the two things we want to do. And the point is, character theory will let you accomplish these tasks. Okay, or at least will give you, uh, you know, uh, I mean, will reduce your task. Now, whether that task is doable or not in a, for a given finite group, that's uh, that depends on the group. Okay, but at least it will reduce your task. Yes. If A you take F, 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 is, F is finite. F is finite field. But that is a statement over a just a field. No. Huh. A is so a. If you take A is equal to F. Okay. No, no, there is no group. Let us check. No, no. Wait a second. Wait. Let us take A equal to F. Okay. So what are A modules then? No, no, no. Wait a second. Wait a second. Don't rush. A is equal to F. So what? what is M? It's a finite dimensional F module. It's a finite dimensional vector space. Okay? All the three are equal, you know, the, it's true. All the three conditions hold. Yes. This does not say anything about the irreducible uniqueness of the, uh, no, it does not. I, at least I'm not put it there, but the decomposition is unique. Um, uh, you know, in the sense that I said, okay, the number of, see, if, if I write it as, if some of these are, irid, some of these are uh, mm, isomorphic, you collect them, and then you collect, it's kind of like the same thing, uh, if you know the, or even, let's take even more simple, prime factorization of an integer, okay? The same numbers occur to the same, the same primes occur, you know, you can write two here or two at the end, but if you collect all of them together, it is two to the sum power, that power is unique, right? Similarly here, this, if, if you take the, take the ones that are isomorphic, collect them, take the next bunch which are isomorphic, collect them, then the powers that you see, then the how many times each one occurs is unique, moreover, we'll, will even prove a slightly stronger uniqueness statement. So for the moment, just uh, there is a uniqueness statement, but for the I ask you to postpone thinking about it because we are going to prove a very precise statement in our context. How do you know that? How, what what is the theory? Yeah. 
what is the what is the proof hmm. okay this is true so it's a kind of, it's a version of jordan holder if you wish so a jordan holder will do, do the job that's even stronger if you want in particular case it might be it might be that yes yeah but jordan holder will do the job for you even when it is not a direct sum but it's a it's a there is a uniqueness that jordan holder gives you a uniqueness okay so that's another way to but we will we will do the uniqueness uh, as i said the uniqueness holds in great generality okay we will do the uniqueness in our situation it will just pop out okay so the, it is unique but let's for the moment don't worry about it okay now two comments before i start proving the proposition okay so the comments are such a module for which this these conditions hold such a module is called semi simple okay so the definition m as in the proposition about is called semi simple if the equal if the conditions hold If either one or two or three hold, then all of them hold, and such a module you call semi-simple. Okay. Second comment is that uh, so remark proposition holds more generally. for for modules over a ring uh, maybe uh, with um, finiteness um, so i have to say with two written without finiteness i hope you understand what i'm saying okay so this is a, uh, well it is not even important that you understand what i'm saying it's just important that you remember what i'm trying to convey here that this proposition is very general it's a very formal the equivalence of these three conditions is very formal so if i take a ring and a module and i say m is a sum of simple modules it's a sum of symbols of modules it makes sense and then if i say m is a direct sum of course i cannot say it is finite that's what i mean by say with two written without finiteness if i say there exists a collection of simple sub modules such that m is a direct sum of those or this every sub module of m admits a complement these three are equivalent but the proof is slightly difficult in general okay so uh, the, you have to use john's lemma you, it becomes it's a very general fact that it's true but you uh, know unique, uniqueness holds in that context uniqueness of that those uh, uh, it holds in a very general context and uh, it's true but let's not at this moment you, i'll be happy if you just remember somehow that this is a very general phenomenon the proof is uh, a little more involved it's not something beyond your uh, capability i wouldn't say that but maybe at the moment slightly a side light not a not a highlight 
Okay, so it's best that we do not spend too much time on it. Okay. For example, it'll it'll be in such basic books as uh, Jacobson's book will have this. Jacobson's basic algebra has a proof of proof of the equivalence of these three conditions in the general case. For any module over a ring. Okay. For any module over a ring. O over any ring. Right. So should we prove now the equivalence of these three conditions? Okay. okay. Let's prove the equivalence of these three conditions. Okay. This is obvious. If there are submodules like this, their sum itself is n. So if I take the sum of all simple submodules, so this is obvious. How about 3 implies 2? Okay. So let's let's try 3 implies 2. So if m is irreducible or if m is simple, okay, we are done. I can just take this sum to be just m itself. Okay, if not, there exists 0 not equal to n. Which is uh, the submodule, proper submodule of M. Right? So choose a complement. Okay. So you have M is equal to N plus K. Now, now what? If n is simple, done. Not simple, break. You know, it has something. Okay. Now, why should this? Because, because the dimension is finite. Okay. Okay. So okay. So now, uh, if n is uh, n is simple, consider. Okay. Okay. Etc. So, since the dimension of M is finite over F, over F, this process must stop. I, I can't keep on getting submodules for keep on getting submodules and you know proper submodules. Huh? Okay. So, since dimension of F over M is finite. The uh, we get that's for three implies two, right? Okay. Now let's prove one implies three. Okay, so one implies three. Let n be a submodule. I want to get a complement of that. I know one. So, M is a simple, simple module. Yeah.
Jan Lindas sagt, Herr Mies, auf Gott lernen. No, it's not, that's all you know. But where is the N1 N2? You are just given N. There are, well, that's not clear because there you might not have any submodules of all dimensions. It's not, it's not. M is finite dimension. M is finite dimension. Huh? Yes. Yeah. True M, yes, correct. That, that, why is that why is that a submodule of a submodule it's an f vector space yeah. f vector space complement we know but why is it an a submodule see that way mash case theorem would be true no matter what you do right yeah. nothing no condition on the field or anything on the group or the field that's obviously not true question is how are you going to make it an it's going to be an, to find an Complement as a vector space is, is no problem. So what you say works. But the problem is how do you find the complement as an A module? Okay? So you have to use the hypothesis. It's not true otherwise. We have seen that, right? There are finite dimensional modules which do not have uh, submodules which do not have admit complements. So we saw that the group ring. If the characteristic does uh, divide the order of the group, then the, we've seen that, that that I, what we wrote as I, does not admit a complement. So, yeah? so mm. N is the sum of simple modules. Why? N is the sum of simple modules. If N is the sum of simple modules, hmm. then any sum module of N can be also written as the sum of simple modules. Why? No, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm asking. I mean, it's not clear. We are trying to prove, right? Again, by induction, what is the problem? What is the, what is the, yeah, tell me. If it's not a problem, just I should agree, right? Write N equal to M1 plus N2 plus N. N is equal to? M equal to huh. M1 plus N2 plus N2. Right. Where M1's edges are simple modules. Right. Take the intersection with? With? M1 plus N2 plus dot dot NK. But that is M. Ah. Yeah. And this sum will be different. Not clear. Even in a vector space, that's not true. If I take two lines, M could be the sum of the x axis and the y axis. N could be 45 degree angle line. So the intersection of N with this line is 0, the intersection of N with this line is 0. Yeah? So it's, it's, not, it's not even true in a vector space. Okay? So here is a kind of, but it's not, you know, but that tells you what to do, sort of. Well, there is some idea of a projection. What you can do is something like this. Okay. Now here is, so choose, so write, okay. choose a sum, cho choose a, so, Right, <coughs> m is equal to m1 plus mk with mi simple. Right, choose. Uh, sum of the mj maximal with respect to inclusion with the property Okay, so let's not contest. Maximal, with respect to inclusion, is obvious. Uh, maximal such that 
intersection with n is So is that statement clear? So I choose various sums. I look at m1, m1 plus m2, m2 plus m3, mk plus mk minus 1, mk plus mk minus 1 plus m1, m2 plus m3 plus mk. I have various sums of these. Right? There are finitely many and there are various sums of this. Okay? Now I look at where look at all of them, look at the intersections with respect to n. Of course, right, if I take empty sum, then that is 0. Empty sum is considered 0. The, the empty sum has intersection 0 with n. So at least there is some sum which is 0 with n. Therefore, I look at the at a maximal possible thing. This is not unique. Such a thing is not m1 plus m2 might be maximal mk minus 1 plus mk might be maximal. In the case of uh, two lines, if m is two dimensional vector space, with, this, with m1 being this line and m2 being this line, and n being this, right? n intersect m1 is also 0, n intersect m2 is also 0, but not n intersect m1 plus m2. You see, yeah, this is also a complement to n, this is also a complement to n. So the idea is that the complement is not unique. Okay, need not be unique. Okay. So claim is such a maximal thing will be a complement. Okay. So is this clear? Choose sum of M J maximal such that intersection with uh, with n is zero. Is it? Is this is this clear? What we are doing? I'm looking at various sums. If I take the empty sum, I get 0. That in has intersection with n, 0. So at least one of these sums has intersection 0 with n. Okay, that's important to observe that because th there may be nothing with <laughs> which, uh, which intersects n trivially. Right? There is at least one which intersects n trivially. Right? So you look for the maximal one with the property. Th they are arranged with respect to inclusion. So the maximal with respect to inclusion with intersects n in 0. Right? Okay. Now, claim is that is a complement to n. Okay. Call it k. Call such a sum k. Claim m is equal to n direct sum k. Right, so clearly, so n is e, n intersection k equals zero by choice. So there is there is not there is nothing to prove. What you have to show is that indeed you get the, the, okay okay. So we, okay only remains to prove enough to show n plus k equals m right suppose not i mean there are this is an easy proof but uh, maybe you don't need to choose a contradiction but let me just to go by contradiction suppose not then x Choose right, right excess not. 
not uniquely. I'm not saying anything about uniqueness. Right? OK, let's see what uh, we can do. So I, uh, let's do, so uh, if k is equal to, so k is a sum of these, right? k is a sum of them. So um, Okay, well, okay, fix. One of them does not belong to N plus K. Correct? Okay. Now let's uh, n so intersection k plus n j is equal to the plane. And it's enough to show this because k plus mj will be strictly bigger than k, right? k was, no, k, it's sum of the k is mi1, mi2, something. Sum, sum, something. k is the sum of some sum. So let's see. I, ho I hope I get this right. Let's see. So let's see if I can. So the 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 important thing you have to use that is M J is simple. Okay. So uh, let's see n. So let's see. Uh, enough to show. Okay. Okay. So um, okay. Enough to show. So again. So if we if we show, it's enough. It's enough to show. Again, one more enough to show. See, suppose this is this is non-zero. What does it mean? I have n is equal to k plus m j um, with so n equals. This is non-zero. Right? So I want to, OK, so suppose I have this, then I claim I have this, OK? Then that I want to claim this is true. Suppose, uh, suppose this is, tr suppose uh, this occurs, OK? 
then I write n minus k is equal to mj. Okay. Now using this, you know that. Well, not quite. You know that mj mj must be equal to zero, which means n is equal to k, which means n is non-zero. This this is contradictory. Okay, so this is because so I am claiming this will follow from this along with the fact that n intersect k is zero. This is the proof. If if I had this but not this, so this is not true. So I I can write some n which is non zero as k plus mj send k to this side you will get n minus k is equal to mj right but this side belongs to uh, oh, oh did i make a mistake ah yeah this is belongs to n plus k intersect mj therefore it must be zero so this is zero which means mj is 0, which means n is equal to k, which is non zero, which is. Okay. So n plus k intersect mj is 0, because this is because, see, observe, n plus k intersect, so proof, this, pr the proof of this is n plus k intersect mj is either 0 or mj because mj is simple. Correct? But xj but xj is in mj not in n plus k implies n plus k intersect mj is not equal to mj. So n plus k intersect mj equals 0, which means this is true, which means this is true, which means we get a contradiction to the fact that k was maximum. Okay? So here you should write enough to because k is maximum. I mean I have not maximal by choice meaning maximal with respect to the whatever property we stated. Okay. Once again I I, I, I want to say that while this proof looks complicated the way you write it, the idea is uh, I would think of it as a one line proof because um, the, you know, although writing it out is, is wrong, it is sort of clear what you are supposed to do. You, well, it will be clear once you are once you look at the proof a couple of times and get used to the idea. Okay, now um, here are some corollaries. A quotient of a simple module of a semi-simple module is semi-simple. Semi-simple module is semi-simple. No, give me the one line answer. The quotient of a semi simple module is semi simple. What is the proof? Tell me the one line proof. Yeah. Any quotient is? Hmm. 
Yes. Yeah, you are you are making life very complicated by yes correct what you saying has the idea but it's I'm I'm looking for that one line there is a one line answer there are three you are thinking always of condition three there is condition one What does condition one say? Again, one second. I don't want to think like that. I, I, you are, we are all thinking like that. That's the more, you know, sort of uh, very, I want to think slightly more abstractly. M is equal to sigma mi. So, let me write it here. Corollary quotient of a sub simple submodule, semi simple module. I might sh shorten semi simple to SS, is semi simple. Proof. Is the quotient of a what about what can you say about the quotient of a simple module? Simple, simple or zero. So, quotient of a simple module is simple or zero. Right? M is semi simple implies m is equal to sigma mi, these are simple, right? Now, if I write quotient of m is equal to phi of m for some phi an A module morphism. Which is equal to sigma phi mi. These are either simple or zero. If you are zero, you can omit them. So, the quotient of a semi simple module is sum of simple modules. Therefore, it's okay. I, again, I, this is much. This lives. I mean, it's equivalent to the third one, but nevertheless, this is a much more. Uh, no, it seems like I've written a lot, but if, if, if in terms of thinking, it's much, much less. But the proof that the quotient of the simple one is simple. Hmm. Is zero? No. 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 What is the it's What is the kernel? It's either isomorphic to itself or zero. It does not use anything. Simple module has no has no submodules, non-zero proper submodules. So the kernel is either zero, in which case the image is isomorphic to this, which is simple. Or it is the whole thing which is Z. Okay? Okay. So one. How about this? Subs of semi simple or semi simple. Now you might want to think like what you are doing. This will this is the what you are <laughs> what you are asking it is true but we are proving it not as a as a corollary of what we, of the of the proposition rather than as a sub, as a step in the proof of the proposition
Okay. No, you see, the answer has to be very elegant. You should not, you should just write, correct, you can, I mean, I want a, that, yeah, the proof is not difficult, but uh, I want an elegant answer. Uh, that's the correct way to do it. So, if, uh, right, given n, choose k such that n is equal to n plus k is equal to m then observe then n by m by k is isomorphic to m but this is a quotient that is semi simple so is m okay That is a, a much more, uh, so, uh, m by k is semi simple by above. Let's make a uh, definition. F is a field. Yeah, so Ninga Epoca, Epoca, Right, okay. So F a field, A a finite dimensional A algebra. For example, group ring over a finite group. Okay? Then A is called semi-simple or left semi-simple. If A is semi-simple as a left A module, Definition makes sense. I've assumed A is finite dimensional A algebra because we have defined semi simplicity only for modules that are finite dimensional as uh, modules which are finite dimensional over F, over the field. So uh, since I'm considering going to consider A as a module over itself, I want to make sure that A is finite dimensional. That's why I assumed it's a finite dimensional A algebra. Finite dimensional there means, of course, it's finite dimensional as a vector space over F. Okay? Semi simple. Corollary. G finite group. Uh, characteristic F field, characteristic of F does not divide the order of G. There's okay, a hypothesis, conclusion F G semi simple.
है वाई बाय बाय मैश के स्थिर अप्लाई टू एफ जी ओके बट एक्चुअली ओके सो लेट्स ऑब्जर्व दिस पॉइंट ऑब्जर्वेशन लेट ए बी ए डायमेंशनल रेफर्स टू Dimensionality over as a, as an f vector space. Okay, finite dimensional a module is semi-simple. Okay, the proof here is the following. Okay, proof. Let, uh, let M be a finite dimensional A module. Say M one, M n, V, and F basis of M. Right, it's a finite dimensional module. Means a module. The finite dimensional refers to finite dimensional as a vector space. So it has a finite dimensional basis. So, so M is generated clearly, generated as an A module. By M one, M n. It's even clear generated as a F module, F vector space by these elements. So in particular, it is generated by a as an A module by these. Now, suppose I take. n copies and map it to m by let's say a1 a2 an going to a1 m1 plus a n m n right this is an on to map so it's the image of a direct sum n if i can show a direct sum n is semi simple then n will be semi simple because it's a quotient now why is a direct sum n semi simple well a is semi simple and it's a finite direct sum so if a is you know if a is a sum of simple modules you take those simples And then the simples for the next one, then the simples for the next one, etc., and take them all together. Right? Okay. So, uh, thus, M is a quotient 
of A direct sum n, which is as Okay, then, so if I have a semi-simple algebra, then any module over it is semi-simple, okay? Okay, I repeat, uh, so many of these, the, uh, uh, the finite dimensionality over F is a, is a crutch. Many of these things hold very, quite generally, and so, um, if in a context, if you encounter a context where uh, such things are necessary, you should just look up the appropriate uh, reference. Okay? So uh, it is for simplicity that we are taking this assumption, making this assumption. Okay. Right. I, it's enough to take that they are generating set. Uh, I could just, F span of I could have written that. The minimal generate, that is irrelevant. What is important is that it generates. The minimality of the generation is irrelevant. Just need a finite, Just need a finite set, yes. Actually, even finite is not required. But let's not, let's not get, let's not get, I, again, I don't want to get sucked into that, okay? So we are always thinking in finite dimensional vector space. Again, that may not be required, but all right, okay. Now, so, so now we can start on character theory. <laughs> Okay, so the two problems are, I repeat, given, so we've, we've observed that there are only finitely many irreducibles, right, by, we gave an argument. Uh, well, okay, so we, um, our group is finite and our uh, field is complex numbers by assumption. So G is finite and uh, base field is C. That's our assumption. So you can either use the, that every simple module is a quotient of the group ring and uh, use a Jordan Holder theorem or it is even simpler than that if, you know, you, you actually have that it, Mashke's theorem, so it splits, so you can actually see uh, that if you write FG as a direct sum of simples, then any simple must be one of these simples, isomorphic to one of these simples. That's not very difficult to see, but that, that let me again not get sucked into it because you will get it out of the proof that we are going to do anyway, okay? So there will be finitely many irreducibles. Question is, what are they? So, Classify irreducibles, that is one problem. Second problem is given a representation, say a finite dimensional representation of this group G, I want to, I know by Mashke that it is a direct sum of simple irreducible, thanks to our proposition now. 
Mashke will tell me condition 3 is true, therefore condition 2 is true, therefore it is a direct sum of irreducible representations. So, how do I, what are the irreducible representations that occur there and to what, what are the multiplicities, meaning to what you write it as a direct sum, right? Several of them are, if I, collecting several of those, just like you, if I write an integer as a prime factorization of an integer, I will collect all the prime powers together, right? You will write 2 to the sum power, 3 to the sum power, 5 to the sum power, so on, right? Similarly, you collect all the irreducibles that are isomorphic together and then call the power that you put there as the multiplicity, okay? We will see that that is unique. Again, that is a holds very generally, but we will observe that it is unique and the question is, what is that number? Given the representation, we want a method to determine that number, okay? Now, I repeat, what we will do is that a, an in-principle strategy for finding this out. And this strategy is quite easily implemented in small groups that you know, order, you know, in groups of small order that you know, orders that you know, and in many cases, but uh, of course it's, um, you know, and it's, it, it runs in, you know, given a certain group, for example, symmetric group, uh, what are all its irreducible representations and uh, these have been classified and the answers known, but there is, you know, these are many other questions are, which are related are topics of current research interest, okay, depends on G. Okay, so let's go about this. So, I will start by sort of uh, doing it from some other angle. Okay, maybe I should stop here because uh, it's the record is they have to go. Okay, um, I um, so we'll choose time record from Lama. Okay, so thank you. So. I will have this done on Tuesday if we didn't get it and we'll have it recorded so that